topic we're going to hear about today are uh, shockwaves. Um, it's interesting because many people have heard of shockwaves, but um, they don't necessarily know how, how they work, what happens, and even if they have some kind of concept of what's going on, you know, how to understand, uh, how to put it into mathematical terms is even more difficult. So here we have uh, today uh, our very esteemed professor, uh, Professor Zhang, who will, uh, you know, um, will explain to us how exactly it works, how to model such events, and uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to you today Professor Zhang. Thank you very much, Wuri, to, uh, for the introduction and the invitation. I'm very pleased uh, to come here and give you a presentation. So, so today I'll cover several things. First is what is shockwave, the phenomenon, okay? and then how do you model it, okay? And then a little bit of theory, a few minutes. Then I'll tell you a couple of uh, wonderful discoveries, you know, from the studying of the shockwave, and then you apply the theory to real world and you will be surprised how useful the mathematics uh, help uh, the real thing. So first, um, the phenomena. Okay. 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 Topic is shock waves. So the phenomena is the following. Okay. So if you get a, a missile, okay, that travels very fast, supersonic that is, okay? and it goes faster than the speed of sound. Then, ahead of it, you, you see a surface, okay? and this surface has zero width. Ahead of it is the uh, unperturbed rest air. Okay? And behind it, this is a pressed or compressed compressed air, meaning the pressure is greater than before. So pressure high pressure. Okay. The pressure changes in zero width, like zero time. Okay. So if you're standing somewhere like there and you hear nothing because this guy travels faster than the speed of sound. Before you hear anything, this thing will come and hit you. Okay. So you see, you're standing there, nothing happens. And all of a sudden, this shock wave comes and knock you down. Uh, if you stand really still tight, you, you see this very high pressure, a pressure wave coming and, and okay, hit you. Okay, and it's caused by this moving objects like a missile or a super fast uh, airplane missile. Okay. <laughs> So that's the phenomenon. Okay. Pressure changes suddenly. Okay. So how do you model this? Model uh, starting from Euler uh, around uh, 17, let's see, 70, okay. 200 sometime years ago. All right. He said. Um, for the air, let's assume it's ideal, meaning um, all right, you know that because you're taking physics courses. Uh, so um, in the air, you take a little portion of it, and then he said uh, the mass will be conserved. Mass cannot be really produced and evaporate because that's then. But now, of course, in Einstein theory of relativity, energy and mass can be converted. However, that happens at a very high level. Uh, you have to heat the gas to plasma and even more and use light and it's very hard to, to get into there. But with this pressure change, it's not getting that far. So therefore, that's the uh, conservation of mass, which can be written as this density rho differentiated with to time t plus the rho times the velocity u in the x direction differentiated with the x plus the same rho times the velocity v in the y direction, and there's a z direction, put another similar term, but I'm going to do it in two space dimension. That's conservation mass, very simple. And at the same time, Euler says uh, there's the other conservation, the conservation of momentum. Momentum conservation. Okay. Even now, momentum is conserved right, in, in physics courses. 
whether photons, collide with photon electrons, whichever they collide, the total momentum is conserved, okay? Which is written this way, rho times the velocity u differentiated with the time t plus rho u multiply u again rho square. And this time, there's an internal pressure it's called the P, the sub x plus rho u, the same u, times this v, uh, no, no more, differentiate that y equals zero. That's the momentum in the x direction, and there's the momentum in the y direction. Rho v squared plus the same pressure p sub y equals zero. So. Uh, if we work in three space dimension, there's uh, a third component, rho w, but let's ignore it for now. And then there's the uh, conservation of energy. Okay. So back then, uh, it's, people didn't realize there's the photon electromagnetic field. And even, even, even now, if we consider just aerodynamics, we can ignore electromagnetism. Uh, but in relativity, you do consider that. However, at this point is energy conservation, which says the following. The total energy E, it's a density multiplied by rho, differentiate with the T, plus this rho U E, so every time we, we, we multiply with the U, okay? Plus this uh, rho U pressure, differentiate with the X, plus the same thing, rho, uh, this time is a V E plus rho V P sub Y equals zero, okay? What is the E? E is the energy density, which is, as you can expect, so one half U squared plus V squared, there's a kinetic energy, particles move with the velocity, plus the internal energy, which says you can squeeze air into a smaller volume, but as you squeeze the temperature to go up, okay? Temperature go up means uh, the molecule starts to do this random uh, sort of kind of motion. And that part is measured by this, the pressure over the density. This comes from thermodynamics. However, um, if you use air here and you use like hydrogen in another experiment and use nitrogen in still another experiment, the three different experiments give you different numbers, although you can use the same pure rho. So correspond to the different gas, uh, there's a factor here, it's one over gamma minus one, okay? For air, gamma equals 1.4, for nitrogen is like 1.6, okay? Uh, so gamma is called a gas constant. Different uh, gases give you different number, but that's it. So therefore you see we have four equations for four unknowns, rho, u, v, and p. And so this sort of closed system, if you're taking the different equations, you feel like for each variable, you need an equation, and then that's enough, okay? So this is where I um, started, and I work on this, uh, solving these variables. Given the initial condition, you try to predict the, the future, okay? All right. So therefore you think, well, that, that's just it. So take the ODE course, take the PDE course, and move on and solve for it, right? Uh, that, that's the planning. Uh, so starting in 1770 to like 1890 or 1880, and uh, the many people work on this, like Laplace, Poisson, especially the person at Laplace, he said, yeah, um, give me the initial condition uh, of the current world. I can use different equations to predict the future. And that's it, okay? We need no politics, no nothing, it's a beautiful. Of course, that didn't work because uh, as they start to solve these equations, uh, they meet this thing called the turbulence. Okay, you, you hear this from physics courses, meaning the following. Um, you, you, you have a differential equation, you have initial condition. It's like you have uh, two labs. Okay, one professor at the lab, the other professor at the lab. And the lab is prepared identically the same. And the initial data is, theoretically speaking, identically the same. And they do the experiment and let the uh, experiment run. And at the beginning, they might be the same, but after a little short time, these two identical experiments develop two different solutions. Okay. 
right, so Laplace's idea won't work because there are two, and then eventually, if we have 100,000 experiments completely identically prepared, yet later on they're different. That's the turbulence. So for turbulence, you do a statistical average, then da, 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 it's getting hard. So the Euler equation is capable of doing that. Okay. Even though, even though that turbulence, but for most people of physicists, we believe that um, we see this phenomena. We see a, super, a supersonic flying object would produce a, a wave like this. And, uh, uh, and that phenomena uh, has some sort of variation, but it's more or less the same. So we should be able to predict that more or less the same phenomena. Okay, that would be useful. Okay, so from there onward, um, one idea is like weak solution. Okay, so we do not need to use classical uh, ideas to find a solution to this system, meaning you do not need to find continuous, well-defined functions to put the function into the equation and differentiate them and then let them be zero. We don't need that much. All we need is uh, a weaker version, meaning uh, you multiply this equation with a test function, smooth test function, and then do integration, and, and, and then that will be enough. Okay, so that idea is there, and uh, from here, we can get something called a ranking. You go on your relation on uh, shock waves. Okay. And that we, we can handle a discontinuity like this. And in simple cases, we can indeed predict this wave. Okay? So, in simple cases, we already can uh, predict uh, shock waves. Okay. However, we can only do simple cases. Okay. A slightly more complicated cases or um, too difficult, okay? And this is why uh, we can fly, we can fly supersonic, but supersonic commercial flights are not available. Okay, for military uh, machines, yes. You have F-16 or uh, F-18. Okay, they, they fly, they fly uh, uh, supersonic. Okay, uh, the Concorde, the European Concorde uh, airplane can fly uh, three times the speed of sound. And uh, they flew for several years, maybe 10 years, and then they went bankrupt. Uh, why? Um, first is a safety issue. Okay, uh, it's not reliable. Uh, and then because they need to make it safer and then it costs cost them more and at the beginning it's already losing money so then they couldn't continue and it went bankrupt. Okay? Therefore, the rest of the job is to uh, make better predictions, predict more and better so that we can design the airplanes to fly smoother, um, more reliable, at a lower cost. Okay, so that, that's, that's the job. Okay, now, okay, so, um, comparison. So from, let's say, 1950 to the present, we fly this machine called Boeing 747. Okay. Very long ago, people can fly the Boeing machine. And the present day, they have Boeing 
747 uh, number 8, the series 8. But in the same period, okay, this is a fly, and let's look at the computer. Okay, in 1950, uh, so it's called the mainframe computer. Okay, um, all right, I, I guess I don't have to say that much. Uh, back in 1950, the first sort of a computer was there, and it took up to this room to do a simple calculation. Okay, but now, <laughs> you know, the computer chips are everywhere. It's that little size, like a flash drive. That little one guy can operate so many. All right, so it's no comparison. Okay, therefore, I feel like there's so much room for us to to do this. Okay. Second, okay, now I want to mention something. Um, applications of the the study, okay. So application of a shock wave, okay. Um, one of them is the following, okay. Around 1945, okay. Uh, the U.S. made this first uh, atomic bomb, okay, and, and then they want to use it. So, um, as usual, they were planning just to, to take the bomb and drop it in a place in, in Japan and then quickly leave because uh, it's an atomic bomb. When it explodes, it will cover a larger area, so it will be very dangerous to those who drop it. Okay. Um, but then this guy, uh, von Neumann, suggests that to do the following, okay? Uh, he used this system and used the very first computer, it's in 1945, to do simulations on, on, on this wave, okay? And he experimented. Before he had a real bomb, he couldn't do experiment. So he can only do it mathematically and numerically. He ran it and he said, if you do the following, your uh, explosion power damage would be twice as much. Okay, just do this simple trick. Okay, what is it? He says, The military was about to do the following, drop the bomb here, on the, you just drop it and then leave. Okay. So it will be hitting on the ground. Like in the old days, you threw a grenade and grenade land on the ground and explode. So if this the case, then this would explode, would produce a shock wave that goes outward. Okay. And that's time one, and that's time two. So for a building or a person sitting there, the shock wave would come and knock him down, or a building knock down, and that would be it. Okay. And von Neumann says, this is the old. Okay. Von Neumann said the following, because of his mathematical theory, he said, drop the bomb somewhere in the middle. Okay. Release it and let it explode there. And that will produce a shock wave like this. And then this shock wave was going down. Okay. Okay. And then the shock wave would be something like this, hit the ground, and then reflect, and then hit the ground again. And the next time it's here, this would travel outward. Okay. And this would travel down, hit it, and reflect. Okay. Goes still forward, and this goes up forward. Okay. So imagine a person is standing there, and the shock wave will come and knock him down, and the next shock pick him up and then drop him down twice as much. Okay. And indeed, if you read the story, uh, those who experienced this, is that one person was staying clearly, said, it was a nice day. But then all of a sudden, the whole roof collapsed down. Okay. He was knocked down. Okay. And then got lifted up and <laughs> dropped again. Twice as much. These military say, oh, just the bomb, okay? But when they do the damage and they look around, it's much more, much worse than they thought. And when the second bomb would drop, and that's it.
period, you know, surrender without any condition. Condition is just give up completely. So that that's one application. And because of this, a couple of others, uh, he was getting so well known, so famous, and the military respected him so much. So when he was dying, he was he died at a very young age because of uh, overwork or sickness. The military was like holding him like a treasure and you know getting advice from him. What else you have? <laughs> Such as so the yeah, the, <laughs> the, uh, legendary people. Okay, von Neumann. Suggestion. Okay. okay. As you can t probably tell, that he is a Jewish. Yeah. Um, <coughs> second, um, so we have this Boeing. 747, uh, number eight is the intercontinental. Let me see. Um, intercontinental. Okay, and it's the first the flight uh, was. Uh, March 20th, 2011, okay? This, this is the most advanced uh, Boeing machine. Of, of course, there was something like this back then, but that's the primitive one, like one or two. The most advanced is the number eight. Uh, but it still travels like at uh, like 80% of the speed of sound. Okay, it's a subsonic. And then um, I have the address, the web address of, uh, of this uh, first flight, the video. Okay, it's available you know, from Boeing. Oh, by the way, a student of mine uh, uh, from Penn State, he did a, a, a intern with me, I got a job from Boeing. So he's going to, to Boeing uh, this summer, he got a long term job. Okay, so it's very nice. And then um, after this, and then we have this Concorde. I uh, think the French word Concorde. And this travels at uh, maximum uh, three times the speed of sound. Three times. The speed of sound. Okay, but as we said earlier, um, the so maintenance is cause of the oil, um, uh, it's inefficient, so it's bankrupt. But l look at the development of the computers. I just feel like, how could we just stay there with subsonic flight? There's so much room to improve. Why, why just stop there? So indeed, um, there's a template in here. It's called a scramjet. Okay. So I didn't mention the real, the, another trouble of Concorde. The Concorde not only costs a lot of money, but the, uh, one real issue is that as it flies over land, it produces this shock wave, and the shock wave traveling in ground, it, it damages windows, okay? It shatters windows. So therefore, over land, uh, it can only go along the rural area. But even along the rural area, the farmers wouldn't like it. So therefore, the Concorde can only sort of fly over the ocean. That limits its route, okay? So to overcome that damage, th th so far there's no way, okay? The only way to, to sort of overcome that problem is invent this thing called a scramjet. What is it, okay? This scramjet is something like this. This is the Earth, okay? And you launch this scramjet all the way up to like upper atmosphere, getting out of the atmosphere, <laughs> all right, and, and travel there. However, if it's getting out of the atmosphere, it needs fuel, it needs oxygen. If you always travel there, you have to carry your own oxygen, and that's too expensive. So in the end, the idea is this, you go out of the atmosphere, and if you fly, you, you, you cruise for a while, and then when you run out of oxygen, you fall down. That's okay. You fall down here, 
and then you accelerate in air. Once you accelerate, you get out. Okay? And then you go down, and you go up. Okay? From New York to Japan, you take 20 times. It's like you do that, uh, what's that? Oh, you got a little uh, skin a rock. <laughs> skin <of> rock. <laughs> so it touches the surface more than it goes like that. Okay? It's been tested twice so far. Okay? They need a third time. I think they're scheduled to do so very soon. Okay. So this scramjet is in progress. So 20, 18 times maybe from New York to, to Tokyo, uh, it takes less than two hours. Okay. Current time is like 12 hours. Okay. We drop it one six. Two hours like here, right? Tra commute from here to your home, right? Nearby <laughs> in New York traffic, <laughs> two hours. Okay. So with that, I think I'll be happy. That would be comparable to the development of a computer chip. Okay, um, so to achieve that, of course, we avoid the, the, this shockwave damage is number one. Number two, uh, we get the efficiency, okay? You, you need to take into the cost uh, of maintaining them and the liability, no, sorry, safety and uh, cost. Otherwise, you run out of business, okay? Um, So I think that's all I want to say uh, for now. And any question, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, any discussion, any interest, yeah. yeah, yeah. What are the advantages of having supersonic flight from military? Like for military? Yeah. If you don't, and the Russians have it, and then you're dead. <laughs> Like oh, a, pi uh, fighter plane. Oh, fighter plane. Oh. Yeah. Fighter plane number one. And then, of course, you want to move the military power fast. If you have this jumbo jet that can move 500 people in supersonic speed, imagine. Okay, you can do it. Yeah. And remember, uh, several years ago, uh, oh, well, during Clinton's administration, they sent uh, uh, these military stuff from here in the US to Kosovo. I get that president and the damage and all kind of stuff purely by sending two airplanes taking off from the U.S. mainland, get the missiles, get everything there, and within like ten hours or something, and they resolve the issue. Okay, the the missile the explosives that were carried from here, not from a military base in the ocean. Yeah, it's just two pilots taking the airplane and going there and bomb the bridge, and the president gave up. I thought it was a joke, but they did. And because of that, like an easy uh, uh, thing, Bush thought he could do so with uh, Saddam Hussein. But it didn't happen. It's just, he just got, didn't surround until the last minute he got you know, out from the hole. You, you're probably too young for this. Okay. <laughs> huh? You remember? Right. Yeah. Right. But, but the, the military action with Kosovo. No, we were too young. That was so, so quick. It just like, decided one night, and the next day when I woke up, it solved. Resolved. Okay, they bomb a couple of bridges, and then that's it. Yeah, I, when I re recollect this, I thought, well, people from Europe may have a better living condition. They thought, you know, if we argue, okay. If I lose, then not much. So, uh, you know, if you start a bomb, okay, fine, fine. Let, let's live a normal life, no point. But with uh, Iraq, the war dragged on for a long time, and it caused a lot of lives. And I thought, with this over power, overwhelming power and military uh, supremacy, I, I believe Iraq, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein should give up a lot earlier, but he didn't. So, so that, I don't understand. Anyhow, so if you have the speed, if you have watched the Top Gun, the movie, <laughs> yeah, you will see the reason. Speed. If you don't have the speed, you're really dead. So, in, uh, in addition to speed, let's compare the U.S. tank and the, the Soviet tank. At least about 15 years ago, when I was keeping track of this, but now there's no point. Back then, the, the, the Soviet Union made tanks that was very powerful. The U.S. was also catching up with it. So, in comparing at that time, the difference is this. The U.S. tank can aim Soviet Union's tank without seeing it. So if you're on the other side of the mountain, 
I can use the satellite or, or the electronics to see you already. And the Soviet Union has to see you by eye in order to do something. So you have advantage, right, number one. Eventually, this guy have that too. But then the US tank can aim the target while moving, while in motion. And the Soviet tank has to stand still and then take aim. So that speed of second of delay, uh, you know, you're not at advantage. Like a cowboy, you know, I can ride a horse and shoot, and you have to stand and aim. No, no. So that's the why during the uh, Cold War, the U.S. funding of this was enormous. <laughs> okay, the National Science Foundation, the uh, uh, ARO and the Navy, uh, they all have lots of money because it's a compare, it's a competition between technology. If you have technology, you have the power, then you're there. Like the nuclear atomic bomb. Imagine the, the Nazis have it. Okay, you have to have a couple. Right? Or the Japanese have them. They drop a few here, and you lose. Yeah, it's just that clear. The one bomb killed the entire city. <laughs> so if you didn't have this, I would never believe the Japanese could give up that easily. The Japanese were known to, to fight to, 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 the, to their last minute. You know, they, won't, they won't give up. They won't surrender. But with the two bombs there, and they look at the area, it's just, it was once the entire city alive and active, and all of a sudden, the entire city become a desert. So they, they give up without any conditions, just surrender. Okay. So that's technology. Okay. So nowadays, of course, you know, some people can fight at night when we do not have night vision. You know, you're walking without seeing anything, and the other guy has night vision. How can you fight? <laughs> in that situation. No. <laughs> That's technology, yeah. Does the scramjet or similar technology solve the problem of causing that shockwave if you're flying over land? Uh, correct, yes. Because it goes up in the... Um, but when you, when you go back down to, to pick up acceleration and pick back up, are you causing another shockwave? Or um, that, that's very short. It's like a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the so dipping short, part. Short burst? Yeah, short burst, yeah. And most of it is gliding on the top. It's so like, you, what's that, scooping rock? Yeah, it touch on the surface very shortly. But then it glides in a long period of time in the, in the ocean, in the upper atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, more ideas are welcome here. Uh, you know, design better one. Apparently, the Concorde idea the, U, the Boeing machine, the Boeing company considered it, and then they did a, like, um, a planning stage, and they concluded that they would not make money. So they didn't pursue. But the French uh, was very idealistic. They think they're this you know, better kind of people, and they're uh, idea-driven. They, they have to come up on top of the US. Okay? The US has a Boeing, and they have to have something better, faster, and they think they can uh, manage. But in the end, they give up. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so this, okay, it's, it's still in progress, it's, okay, it's not much. Yeah. We'll take one last question. Yeah. For the scramjet, how fast do you travel to get out of the atmosphere? Uh, get out of the atmosphere, um, it's the speed of the rocket, okay, um, it's a couple of minutes, yeah. depending on how fast you want it. If the fastest is the, the rocket, the, land a satellite or to, you well, know. Escape velocity. Yeah, so it's escape velocity. You can get up to there. But it uh, depends. Um, that's the upper limit, I think. If you get it too fast, people wouldn't be so comfortable. Uh, it, it can be just as fast as the Boeing machine. It can be, uh, uh, let's see, subsonic, very slow, goes up gradually. And then once you get too close to the upper, uh, upper atmosphere and fire, and then it goes up and down. So it's not really like this bad. If you look at the skipping rock, the rock actually goes quite uh, flat. It's not like shooting up and down like this. Okay? It's just the touch on the surface of the atmosphere. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> right. and stay tuned for further events uh, and from events in the future. <laughs>